Hello, I'm Steven, and like many of you, I love fonts, and I also love neon. And usually these two different crafts do not coincide. Neon bending is more attuned to lettering, not type. But there are various ways in which these two disciplines have uh, influenced each other over the last 50 years or so, and this is a, talk will be a brief survey of that cross-pollination. First, a quick note on the origin of this talk. I gave a shorter version at uh, Neon Speaks, a conference in August put on by San Francisco Neon, a wonderful organization who is helping to preserve signs throughout the Bay Area and really leading a movement of sign preservation that's going on all around the country and the world. And they put out this great Saving Neon Best Practices Guide, which I highly recommend. Um, and do walking tours uh, around the Bay Area, and I highly recommend you check them out at SF Neon. But this talk will be slightly extended from that version. There's some new content, and so if you caught it for that show, uh, you'll find some new stuff in this version. First, I want to whet your appetite with uh, some neon examples. These come from my day job at Letterform Archive, which is a library and museum in San Francisco. In non-pandemic times, we're open to the public for tours, and this is the sort of table that you would expect to see on a general intro tour at the archive. A broad overview of the history of lettering and printing and typography. Now that we're really serving our public online rather than in person, uh, we've been trying to bring this experience of touching and uh, viewing these objects um, to the internet, to uh, everyone around the world, no matter where you are, through virtual visits and online programming. So check out letterformarchive.org for more. But beyond these general tours of the collection, we often give customized tours, depending on the interests of the group or the class that's visiting. This is an example of that uh, where I set a table for Neon Speaks, uh, the conference that happened in 2019, um, specifically with material from the archive uh, surrounding Neon. So we have some reference books here. We have some examples of sign painting with the movie banners there in the top right. Uh, we have some type specimens that include fonts inspired by Neon, which we'll look at more of later. And at the bottom left is this really beautiful 1930s portfolio of neon from a shop in Chemnitz, uh, eastern Germany. From 1930, has these uh, letters that show some of the products and services they provide, but the beauty of it are these photographs, hand-tinted um, examples of their neon signs in action. And these show that neon signs can represent all different kinds of lettering, whether they're scripts or block letters. In scripts, you can have the neon all in front of the, the base or the tin can or cabinet of the sign. In block letters, you need to have the glass tube bend and go behind that cabinet so that only the uh, block letters are shown. But often, neon lettering or typefaces represent the, the script form because it, it kind of uh, evokes that connected letter shape. Another thing to keep in mind is that signs are often vertical. These are called blade signs, and it's really the best way to make the most use of a building's edifice and make the sign visible as you're walking down the sidewalk. So blade signs are quite common, unlike in typography where you rarely see stacked glyphs or stacked letters like this. This is something that's really specific to um, sign lettering. Another example of something that is found in the archive is not this film, but the archive of Dorothy Shepard, who actually designed the neon sign that's shown in this film. You'll see some great bulb uh, lighting that uh, those fish are uh, filled with but also some neon tube lighting with the uh, bubbles uh, that are animated there. Dorothy Shepard uh, worked for Wrigley's uh, along with her husband, Otis Shepard, 
And because we have their archive at Letterform Archive, we have objects such as this comp, uh, her drawing for this sign, which at the time uh, that it was designed and installed was the largest electric sign in the world. Here's a photograph of it in New York uh, as seen in Fortune magazine. So these uh, photographs uh, or these images are, can be found in the online archive. Go check them out at oa.letterfromarchive.org. And I hope that's whet your appetite for some uh, of the neon that we'll see represented more in typeface form for the rest of this presentation. First, some definitions. Most of us here at ATYPI are familiar with the differences between type and lettering. Um, but it's useful to understand why uh, neon is, is, works better when things are lettered rather than typed. Um, and the main differences are that fonts are pre-manufactured letters. They're um, letters that are static. Each letter form has been designed in advance and they're systematic. They're made to work within this predefined system. And so you're really just building a page of letters that have already been made. Whereas with lettering, uh, each letter is custom designed for that moment, for that purpose. And that makes lettering more intuitive and dynamic because you're shaping those letters uh, for the moment, for uh, the specific job at hand. And I love this analogy from Mark Simonson. Uh, type is like Lego and lettering is like clay. With type, you're building with blocks of uh, letter shapes that have been designed in advance. And with lettering, it's more flexible. You can mold it to the purpose. And that's why most neon, at least vintage neon, is made with lettering because it's more flexible for that use. But that doesn't mean that neon hasn't inspired typefaces. And particularly in the 1970s and 80s, it really launched a uh, whole genre of fonts that were inspired by bent glass. So I'm gonna take you through a few examples of these in three different categories. This first category is letter shapes that emulate neon tubes. So each letter is a continuous line uh, that really mimics a single glass tube. Neoscript is from Mechanorma, a transfer lettering or rub down lettering company. Uh, they were a competitor of Letraset based in France. And like a lot of the typefaces you'll see here, um, rub down lettering and phototype were the most common formats for these display typefaces that uh, simulate neon or are inspired by neon. Neoscript was a pretty simple design. As you can see, it's, it's one single glass tube for each letter. Uh, and it's commonly found on album covers from the day. ITC Neon, on the other hand, is a little bit more advanced and it kind of became the basis for a lot of neon type faces that followed. It's a really successful design of multiple uh, kind of concentric glass tubes or a single tube for each letter, but multiple lines to fill that letter and make a much more interesting and engaging shape. Uh, Ronnie Bonder and Tom Carnese uh, designed this in 1970, and they based it on another typeface from 1930, Prisma by Rudolf Koch. And you can see what they've done here is, is pretty brilliant. They've taken a design uh, from the 30s that is multilinear and kind of connected those five lines uh, into a continuous uh, line so that it feels more like neon. Of course, they made some other adjustments to make this work well, but you can see it's directly based on Prisma. And ITC Neon was just all over the place in the 70s. It was used for entertainment. It was used for children's uh, television shows like The Electric Company. It was used for book covers and advertising. Uh, really kind of the granddaddy of neon-inspired typefaces. There were others that came out in the same era. Photo lettering had many neon typefaces. Stan Neon was um, interesting in that it had these different styles with uh, different kinds of backgrounds or outlines to uh, make it feel like a dimensional sign. Piccadilly uh, was much more popular than maybe the photo lettering typefaces because like ITC Neon, or uh, which was released later in Letraset, 
uh, it was available as transfer lettering. And Letraset was widely available around the Western world and, and commonly used. And like ITC Neon, it's based on another Art Deco typeface from uh, this one from 1927, Morris Fuller Benton's Broadway. Electric is kind of a poor man's ITC Neon. Uh, it's not as complex, but in some ways it's uh, useful because it has fewer lines, it has thicker lines, and that way it's more effective at small sizes. ITC Neon can only get so small before it falls apart, so Electric offered this alternative for uh, setting things a little bit smaller. Quicksilver goes into a slightly more three-dimensional direction by uh, creating these highlights that uh, give effect of a rounded glass tube. It was initially designed to emulate a thermometer glass uh, rather than um, a neon tube, which is where the name Quicksilver comes from, from meaning mercury. And the design uh, was uh, by Dean Morris. When he was 16 years old, he submitted this to Letraset, uh, a few letters at three inches, and they loved it, helped fill out the rest of the character set. Um, and uh, Dean tells the rest of this story. If you uh, follow the link from Fonts in Use, you can learn more about this. So Quicksilver was commonly used. Um, and there on the Hagen sign, it's one of these examples that I'll show a couple more of later in which uh, it's neon type coming full circle. It's a, a font that is inspired by neon, or a glass tube at least, and then making its way back to a neon sign. It's a little strange in this case though because uh, the neon tubes here are outlining the original letter shapes, but it still uh, shows that full circle relationship of font and neon. Vegas was pretty popular in the 80s. Uh, here you have the first script example, or the first example I'm showing you, of um, a typeface that's emulating neon. You have neon shapes as individual letters, but they're not connecting together to make a continuous word. So that's what I'm going to show you with the next category of typefaces, and that's letters that connect as uh, single words to uh, emulate a neon tube. Yagi Link Double was um, attempting to do this by offering these different alternate forms so that you could um, you know, choose a different form that would connect the letters better throughout the word. It was designed by Teruki Yagi uh, for Photostar. Often uh, the credit isn't given to him, but uh, fortunately we've learned recently that he's the designer. And this came out in 1968, so even earlier than some of the other examples I showed you, one of the first um, font emula emulations of Neon. Unfortunately, it isn't used too often as intended to connect those letter forms. And it kind of shows a weakness of some of the uh, shapes in that you can't connect you know, an O or a U in these examples. But it does you know, give a good effect of uh, glass tube. Um, and it works pretty well with the metallic foil there of the Quantum Electronics uh, book cover. And also it offers this kind of multicolor effect in some cases. It was also used in pretty wacky ways like this Australian album. Yagi Double was even more successful. It was uh, used quite often, uh, such as on this map of tourist uh, booklet for California, and even more prominently for the logo of CNN, still used today and clearly based on the typeface. Santa Fe now uh, is an example of a script in which the letters are connected, unlike Vegas. Uh, and the, the rounded ends of each uh, letter shape also emulate that kind of rounded glass tube. Tropica's script, um, because it has a hollow uh, interior, can give another uh, effect of neon. Uh, in this case, it's connecting in different ways. So uh, sometimes the hollow interior uh, is continuous uh, you know, as you connect two letters, especially when you use those ligatures. Other times it kind of emulates a glass tube going behind uh, the, the following letter or going into a cabinet that the neon might be placed in, on top of. This last category is 
contemporary or digital typefaces that are inspired by neon. Some of them take it to the next level. Sneaker script is actually inspired by a painted sign uh, on the window of a Berlin shop, but it clearly has some neon influences as well and, and really works quite well when you want to give a neon effect as the designers of the Inherent Vice marketing uh, campaigns uh, show here. This uh, poster is, is uh, using multiple typefaces um, to give a neon effect and, and all of them uh, have a different kind of design but uh, come together quite well. Ohm is uh, one of the latest and most successful examples. It has three different styles. You have this um, thinner interior shape, the outline shape, and then uh, a third style in which you have um, multiple lines, kind of like the ITC neon effect. It was used really nicely by Mark Rossi for the typographics conference uh, uh, logo and animated graphics. As you can see in these windows of Cooper Union, uh, it, it feels almost like lit neon tubes, but this is really just a vinyl or some other sort of printed display, uh, but really an effective um, emulation of neon. And I really like this nice subtle design by Benjamin Shaken uh, for a book cover in which the, neon, uh, the, the type is placed on various angles, kind of showing that effect of neon signs as you're walking down Broadway. Uh, and the idea of, of an animated sign or a broken animated sign is um, mimicked here in the, the word Broadway because he's used that one of those styles uh, for the O uh, to show that maybe that was the, the animated version of the sign and, and it's kind of broken and, and not in sync with the rest of the letters. But uh, this idea of coming full circle uh, is really put into effect here when uh, Tal Lemming, the designer of Ohm, uh, discovered his typeface being used for a market sign. Uh, he was tipped off and was able to go and see it being installed uh, and really seeing proof that his design works as a physical neon sign. I, I can't imagine how satisfying that might be as a type designer to see uh, your concept come together at this scale and in the form that you originally intended. Bungie is a design that's not specifically created to emulate neon, but that uh, inline effect uh, certainly does. Uh, it's by David Jonathan Ross, and uh, it's very clever in that it is um, really responding to what I talked about earlier, which is the stacked glyphs effect, the vertical uh, blade sign effect of a lot of neon signs. Uh, it was designed specifically to be set vertically uh, and uh, does a lot of nifty tricks to make that happen. One of those is the design of traditionally narrow letter forms like the uppercase I there, uh, trying to make it fill uh, the shape in more of a, a square form so that it, it feels more comfortable as a vertical sign. And then here is kind of a tour de force of, of neon emulation in a multi-style optical uh, sized family designed by Craig Eliasson. Not yet released, this is uh, one of the first looks. And as I said, it uh, has optical sizes. Uh, it's, it's, each font is kind of a different density and tube thickness uh, for settings at different sizes. The original premise is making a modulated font with a single width line, as you see uh, in that line where it says on the Piccadilly and Baker Bakerloo lines. Um, so it's rooted in this kind of, uh, well, and then it has other, other uh, styles that have multiple lines. And so it's rooted in this kind of mathematical problem uh, solving rather than looking at actual neon samples. But the effect uh, or the resemblance of uh, two neon is obvious here. Here's another look at the different styles of line densities and of optical sizes or tube or line thicknesses. It also comes with this wild uh, alternative style in which you can see the neon going behind the cabinet as we discussed earlier. Uh, so there are two different styles here to, to give you that uh, effect. 
So this last section shows you typefaces uh, used for neon signs. So going reverse rather than uh, neon inspiring typefaces, here's neon signs that are made with type. Now that's not always what you want to do. And here's a case why the Portland, Oregon sign, for anybody who lives in Portland, it's a really, it's a successful uh, preservation story in that the sign uh, was originally put up in the 40s and has gone over several transformations, but uh, it's uh, survived. But it commits what I would call a no-no, and that's using a font when lettering was working perfectly well. Uh, and so what it really represents is this gradual erosion of lettering over the sign 60 years. It uses a typeface here called Brush Script, but the original design uh, was lettering in 1940 for um, a company called White Satin Sugar. I don't have an image of that, but you see in 1957 when it was uh, replaced by White Stag Sportswear, which continues to use lettering, uh, lettering that emulates the angular style of the illustration of the deer. And so it all comes together really nicely. And then in 1997, uh, when it was um, uh, taken over by Made in Oregon, you can tell a lettering artist wasn't involved here because they've just rotated the W to create an M and the rest of the letters are replaced with brush script, which is just doesn't have the same nice flow as the original sign. Um, and then in 2009, the sign was acquired by the city and it was soon redesigned to read Portland, Oregon. Here's an example of where, you know, type can work for a neon sign. In fact, the same typeface brush script is being used here. But one of the reasons it works so well is that unlike the previous sign where neon is outlining the letters and, you know, losing that effect of a handwritten script, here the neon is creating the interior line or a heart line of the letters. And the A has been replaced with uh, a different shape that, that flows in a better way for the sign. Here's an example of, again, a neon-inspired typeface being used for a neon sign. And here's a typeface line by Letters from Sweden that was not really inspired by neon, at least I don't believe it was, but it works quite well in that uh, use. Uh, in this Viennese restaurant, it's working as a single neon tube that is mostly connected and has a really nice modern effect rather than feeling uh, nostalgic like a lot of neon signs might. It feels like it's of the moment. I have no problem with nostalgia though. And here's an example that is quite effective. Radio is a typeface inspired by a chrome or metal badge that you might see on a radio, old fashioned radio, or a mid-century automobile in which the emblem needs to be a single piece. All the letters are connected. And that works really well in neon. Probably the most elaborate of any typeface launch was Marion's Thieves Like Us exhibition, uh, in which all the members of the family were rendered in neon. And it makes a lot of sense. This is a type family that is all a single mono weight as a black letter, as a script, uh, as a few old style serifs and italics, and uh, it clearly translates quite well as a neon tube. And as another example of type designers working in neon, Frere Jones type's recent uh, SX market fonts are part of a restoration of a 1940s market in New York, and they went into a great deal of research into the original signs, including gas pipe lettering, which is uh, the example of the, the A you see here in which it's easier to create with neon because you have a single stroke or a single tube bend rather than having to create multiple bends going behind the glass. So they did a lot of great research. They've written about it on their blog and um, the effect, if you've been to the Essex market, uh, is probably really beautiful uh, because it's taken these original signs recreated a typeface that can then be used to create more signs uh, and a, a comprehensive identity for the market. So I highly recommend checking that out on their website. Thank you very much. Here's where you can find me. Thank you to all these lovely people for their contributions. Also, thanks to Fonts in Use. Many of the images you saw here come from fontsinuse.com. 
and I'm really grateful for all the participation of our community there who submit examples of neon fonts in action. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah, it, the sun sets fast here in Palm Springs, Rodrigo. Yeah, the, like in, in, in 40 minutes, so even less, in like, in like 30 minutes, it changed from such a sunny, <laughs> sunny light. So it makes it seem like the talk was four hours, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have something. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have a question from Josette. Uh, can you tell us something about the frames? how those forms was cre were created. Uh, about the frames, uh, which which part was that? I'm not sure which frames you're referring to, Jose. Frames. Do you know which, do you, anybody know what he's referring to? Uh, the frames that support the letterings. Hmm. Your ankles and your wrists. The mosquitoes are bad. Here. Okay. <laughs> we just got a mosquito, uh, yeah. a mosquito rag here. Yeah, we don't want you to be eaten by insects. Um, the frames that support the letter. Oh, maybe. Oh, I see what I see. What he's getting at. Yeah. So, um, so when you're putting up neon, um. The cabinet, sometimes called a tin can, um, is usually what's supporting neon. Uh, and that's usually made out of metal um, or it could be porcelain. It could be in, in, you know, nicer signs from the 30s and 40s. Um, it could be no cabinet at all. They call that a skeleton sign. So in the example I showed of the Marion um, exhibit, they don't have any supports at all or maybe they used acrylic or some sort of clear plastic but uh in that case you're just putting the, the glass straight on the wall uh but but for most um uh signs that you'll see on the street they use a, a metal cabinet and lorp is asking about the tightest radius that works with the neon tube that's a good question when i i took a neon bending class uh just a, a few days workshop and um that gave me so much appreciation for tight bends for sharp corners because that's actually the hardest thing to do with neon what you're doing when you're bending a tube is that you have a you're blowing into one end you have a cap on the other and you're putting the tube over a open flame and that flame is is kind of softening the glass and then you're softening the glass and then you take it over to your template that has your letter on it or whatever the shape is and then you have to shape it really quickly before the glass cools the reason that you have you're blowing into the tube is that if you do a sharp corner you blow a little bit to keep the glass uh circumference because if you don't it'll collapse and then you just you have a you know a smashed corner so you have to have a lot of hand eye coordination uh and know what you know the tolerances are of the glass without bending, you know, tearing it apart, you have to keep all this in mind as you're doing it. So sharp corners are really difficult to do. Uh, and that's one reason why whenever I see um, a sign on the street that has a really nice, you know, 90 degree corner or even sharper, then I know that took a lot of work. But anytime you're going any sharper than that, it won't work. You have to actually do a full, uh, you know, uh, kind of a U-turn, if you will, to get it to work. Uh, yeah, we had like uh, one question from Rafael, which was posted in the general chat. Uh, so, what do you think of the material of the Neo Museum in Vegas or the America Sign Museum in? Um, yeah, okay. Cincinnati. Yeah, I haven't been to yeah. either one. Uh, sadly, I, I was going to go to the Neon Boneyard, and it was closed the one time we were in Vegas. So I have not been there, but I know both of those have great collections, uh, and highly recommend that you go check them out. Uh, and then Sandro asks, uh, yeah. LED neons in use in USA, do you think the new neon technology has the same appeal? That's a good question. So two really cool things about neon and the other kinds of gases that are used, argon uh, and a few other gases, they use a lot less electricity than you 
think. Um, they use a lot less than incandescent bulbs. And so they uh, actually, they don't save quite as much energy as LED, but they save a lot. The second thing is that they are completely recyclable because glass is recyclable. So the only thing that is not recyclable on a neon sign is the transformers. That's obviously not going to be, but the glass itself is very, um, uh, you know, environmentally friendly in that way. So I think that's better than LED for the environment overall. The other cool thing about neon is that you have this nice bright glow from a distance, but if you get up close, it doesn't um, hurt your eyes like other kinds of light sources do. So it has all these great benefits. Um, and I think that's the reason it's coming back. Uh, you know, these preservation societies like SF Neon are doing a lot to talk about these, the reasons that it works and, uh, and that it's better than LED and, and incandescent. And that kind of answers maybe John's question too. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's better if we read the questions from the Q&A section because the non-moderators cannot. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's fine. That's, that's why I'm reading out them out loud for the participants to, to hear the questions and to hear your answers. Uh, yeah, so John yeah, also asked, uh, do you think that neon tubes uh, in signs will be disappear with new technologies as LED? And yeah, I guess that answers this question. I know Lawrence also asks, uh, how close can you get with C? size box shadow? Uh, I can't answer that. Unfortunately, I'm not a web designer or a developer, uh, but good question. Maybe, <laughs> maybe one of the web developers in the chat can talk about that. The, the little sign I, did, I showed at the very end was um, that that graphic was designed by Kate Widows. She does the um, identity and branding for uh, the Neon Speaks conference, and she probably has a good answer to that question because she's done stuff for the web. Okay, I think that's all the Q and A's. Uh, yeah, maybe people uh, raise something else further. Uh, yeah, just in case we came up with something else. Uh, yeah, and thanks. Wow, so many useful materials are shared uh, today in in the chat and this exchange. Yeah, that that's really wonderful. <laughs> so yeah, feel free to post anything you find useful. <laughs> 